Okay, so here's how we do the pandemonium example um, in uh, our live demo. Uh, I'm just going to walk through this in this case so that we can you can see what you would have done if this was a live class. So we just have e each person um, gets to choose one of these different features. So you can choose which feature you want to detect. You can detect a horizontal, vertical, or a diagonal line of either sort. Um, and when you see that line, your job is to shout out uh, one, if you see a vertical line, if you chose that, somebody else who might've chosen a horizontal line would shout out two, et cetera. So we're just kind of detecting these using our actual visual system and then shouting out the result. The cognitive demons are again, like layer V2 in the brain, pulling out individual combinations of features. So T is composed of that vertical line, which is the one, and then the horizontal line, which is the two. Likewise, V is the two diagonal lines, A is the two diagonals and the horizontal there. Okay, so then um, the cognitive demons, who again are turning around, they're not seeing uh, the, the, the visual input, are just listening for the individual feature demons, and when they hear somebody shouting out three, four, three, four, and not one or two in the case of A and K, um, then you might get a certain subset of people who actually say six, 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 and, and report that they saw a V essentially. And of course I get to play the role of the over, overall decision demon and uh, report, okay, it looks like we think we we're seeing a V here. So I typically just run the the simulation, the people as, as our neural network individually on each of the features to make sure our features are working. So you would be shouting out two, two, one, one, three, three, maybe that's four, I'm not sure. Uh, and then now we get a real object here. One, two, one, two, one, two. And then we hear uh, the cognitive demons slowly kind of say, well, they're saying one and two, I think that was a five. And we hear five, five, or I just actually often just have them say T, T, T. And then I, as a decision demon, say, okay, looks like we see a T. Everybody's happy. Good. See what you're missing? It's, it's, it's really pretty special. And you can actually see in this kind of uh, emergent collective process, you know, that the brain could be somewhat chaotic. It's always a bit chaotic, but it also kind of works. It is able to detect the uh, uh, overall stimulus by breaking it down into individual features and then reassembling those features. Good, K works, okay, blah, 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 by this point, yeah, I go back to A just so we make sure we're not getting too predictable. Yeah, okay, now we have a problem, okay? And uh, so everybody's in there, they're shouting one, two, one, two, and then the cognitive demons are saying T, 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 and then I have people turn around and look what you're seeing. You're seeing an L. Okay, so what happened? Think about it. Well, clearly we have to introduce some kind of further constraints on the detectors. And in particular, on the layer two, the cognitive demon V2 detectors, they can't just be responding to just a one or a two in isolation. They have to be somehow encoding the combination, the way that those features actually interact, okay? And in fact, as I said, we do know that there are T-junctions and L-junction detectors that are different neurons in the brain in V2, and so there is some evidence for this, but there's kind of a problem here, which is, well, what if we wanted to detect a bar that's just a little bit up, but it's not like, you know, right in the middle, uh, gee, we could really detect any kind of combination of these different horizontal and vertical features. How many detectors are we gonna need to detect everything we can detect? And this really becomes the fundamental problem with the detection model when it's thought about in a very simplistic way. We'll get back to this in a sec. Uh, here's another example of the problem, okay? Uh, you, again, are gonna respond T, but now it's a different relationship among the features. And that gives you a, a sense that this really is a very large space of possible combinations, even of just two simple features. And when you start thinking about the number of different features there are, and then the number of different combinations of such features, 
if you do the math, you end up seeing that it pretty quickly becomes essentially more than the number of atoms in the entire universe, uh, 10 to the 81 or something like that. Um, if you punch in on your calculator, 69 exclamation point, which is factorial, um, that uh, just uh, barely fits in your calculator and the next one, 70, will blow it up. Um, and so even with relatively small numbers, these kind of combinatorics, which are what that factorial um, expression is, is used for, um, really quickly blow up, okay? It's kind of this exponential effect that we're all now very familiar with, with this virus. Here's another example, and this is a little bit different. So this is actually, technically speaking, a three and a four, but it actually, we would mostly say that looks like a T, right? That doesn't look like a V, um, and it's just a little bit rotated. And so now we see, well, huh, the higher level categories have to be a little bit flexible. We have to be able to think creatively and sort of rearrange how we're interpreting the lower level features depending on what makes sense at the higher level, right? So we're thinking, oh, this is a T that's sort of falling over. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. So now you have this opportunity for bottom-up and top-down interactions also to try to come up with an overall interpretation that's not just using the bottom-up features in a feed-forward way, but really reinterpreting the bottom features to say, okay, well, those are actually really a horizontal and a vertical line. They're just kind of tilted a little bit. Here's another example. There is only, theoretically, a one should be shouted out here. Um, and yet, at some resolution, if you kind of blur your eyes, you can see that this is a diagonal. And so now there's this ambiguity again. What is it? Is it a diagonal or is it a vertical? And this is also studied in psychology. It's called the global local effect. People look at this. Um, you can bias people to look at that in a more global or local way. But again, we very quickly would say that's a K and think about those as the diagonal lines. Again, because we have that top-down representation, we know what Ks look for. We very quickly see that as a K. But maybe if we didn't have a concept of the letter K, K wasn't special in our language, then uh, we would not perhaps see that as a K, and we would interpret it as just an interesting combination of vertical lines. So overall, this exploration really helps you see how, first of all, that in general, this kind of breaking down of the big problem into small pieces and kind of organizing the system hierarchically can actually potentially solve these big problems but you need to think a little bit more carefully about how the detection works because it can't be that you detect each individual feature kind of separately um, you need to have something that's going to get right get around this combinatorial explosion problem uh, this problem of needing a detector for every different possible combination of everything because um, that's just simply not workable